NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Can you hear me? And this is why we, this see, welcome already talking about technical issues. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you are. Uh, I'm Brian White from JPL's Office of Communications and Education. And apparently I don't know how to use a mute button like the rest of the country right now. Welcome to the Von Karman Lecture Series. We're here to talk about planetary protection. It protects our solar system from contamination by Earth, uh, and protects Earth from possible life forms that may be brought back. It's a vital process, but not one that's talked about too much. And our speaker tonight will be breaking down how she protects the Earth from the scum of the universe and the universe from the scum of Earth. Now, if we run into any technical technical difficulties like we just did, uh, we ask for your patience and stick with us as we get them sorted out. As always, we like to remind you that this is your space program. We want you to be involved in the conversation this evening please ask questions in the chat and our amazing social media team will pass them along to us and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible throughout our discussion this evening. But if you do not see the chat, please refresh your page and it should be right there. And joining us tonight as co-host fielding your questions this evening is my colleague, Nikki Wyrick. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me tonight. And uh, folks out there, make sure you put lots of questions in tonight. I'm very excited for our speaker and to ask a lot of those great questions for you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Now, our speaker tonight received her bachelor's degree in physics from Hampton University in 2006 and a master's and a PhD in mechanical engineering with a concentration in thermal fluid sciences from Drexel University. She is currently the planetary protection lead for the Europa Lander concept at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, having recently served as the planetary protection lead of the Mars 2020 mission. In addition to her work at JPL, she also enjoys public outreach, collaborating with schools, lecture series such as this one, and media organizations to spread the love of steam. Please welcome Dr. Mujige Cooper. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Brian, and feel free to call me Moo from now on. <laughs> I will call you Moo from now on. It's such a wonderful name. Um, but let's talk about how you got to JPL. And I, I love asking this of our speakers um, because it reminds our audience that there's not just one path to get to JPL. Yeah, exactly. In fact, this, this little visual board here that you see kind of illustrates my journey to JPL. And it started off, you see the little report card icons, those little little cartoons there. I actually was not very good at, at math and science and actually reading too. Um, so for those of you out there that uh, maybe think, oh, I'm not a prodigy, I could never work for NASA. That is not the case at all. Um, so yeah, I started off with poor grades and as soon as I rented Carl Sagan's The Cosmos from the local library, I thought, oh, I want to be an astrophysicist. And now I understood why I had to really take an interest in math and sciences. And all of my grades turned completely around because I was the kid in school that sat through the class thinking, why do I even need this? So yeah, did improve my grades in math and science. Everybody has a nerd origin story. That's me and uh, my younger sister uh, doing marching band. <laughs> um, after that, I applied to um, to college uh, while I was actually when I was 15. That was my one big lesson in setting a goal and failing at it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm glad I did because it took me another year to grow mature. Uh, and I actually started college at Hampton University at 16. And um, after that, all of my summers I spent at NASA Langley, all of the school year uh, times I spent uh, doing research at Atmospheric Sciences, Center for Atmospheric Sciences at Hampton. And eventually I was able to go to graduate school, do an internship um, at JPL. And thanks to Dr. Venka Tesfaran uh, at JPL, I was hired as a postdoc and I began my career at JPL. 
I love hearing you talk about that because it, reminds I mean, your failure you called it your failure in this was yep. that you went to college only a little early out of high school not as early as you wanted to go um yeah. but talk about that i mean that that turnaround between not really being into it and suddenly you that spark in that moment hits you um, yeah it's the that light bulb moment is what i what i call it and i feel like everybody has a light bulb moment everyone has a passion and one day it'll turn on for you and you don't even know why that would happen, right? But it'll turn on and I just wish everybody has their light bulb moment, no matter what field you decide to go into. Very cool. I'm a big fan of those light bulb moments, but let's get yeah. into your topic. Let's talk about yeah. planetary protection. For if you're watching this and you have no idea what it is, uh, when I first started working here, I didn't know what it was. What is planetary protection? Yeah, planetary protection, I always like to bring it back to the basics. Uh, it's kind of like the same rules as when you go to a national park, the whole leave no trace. Uh, when you explore other planets, you want to make sure that you preserve the natural environment that is there, um, especially if there's this high astrobiological interest in possibly finding ancient uh, life. You want to make sure you don't contaminate that environment. And the same thing when we bring samples back one day, we want to make sure that our biosphere is protected from any inadvertent contamination. So. It's just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Um, so let's go to our next image and let's see you doing the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, how, do how do you go about doing this? Yeah, so among many things, we take a ton of samples of the spacecraft. And um, this is one, uh, one illustration of me taking a sample there. Um, and if you go to the next slide, actually, you can see a picture of how we take, uh, if you go to slide number, three, <laughs> you can see also we bake sample, bake our spacecraft out too in small pieces, not the entire spacecraft like Viking, but we, we take parts of the sample of the spacecraft. And this actually is the most critical part of the spacecraft. Uh, it is the tube assemblies and the volume assessment probes uh, and also the seals that's called the DVT. And that is in its little case there um, after it was baked out right before it was integrated at the Cape for the very last time. And that was baked out at 150 degrees Celsius for 26 hours. So that's some of the ways that we, we protect the other planets from us is we sample a ton and we also clean the hardware. Well, cool. Let's talk about if we're going to other missions and, and getting it out there, how important is this? This seems like it would be a big deal uh, with mission development at the early stages of it, too. Yeah, uh, that's a really, really great point. Um, in fact, if you go to the, the next visual aid, we have so many visual aids we put together for you all. <laughs> um, so planetary protection would not work if we didn't have everybody involved kind of on the same page. And all the way from the beginning at the design phase, the engineers who designed these wonderful parts you see here, the seal dispenser on that left side, the sample tube in the storage, which I actually have a fun 3D printed visual uh, aid here, the same thing, uh, and the volume assessment station, all of those parts are going to directly touch the Martian sample. And there was a special part that was designed by the engineers to meet planetary protection needs to keep those critical pieces extremely clean. So if you imagine my finger is the uh, arm inside of the belly of the rover, the way we manipulate the tubes is we take it out of the sheath. And then this represents the tube that you're going to acquire the sample. And this glove, we call it a glove, protects the arm from directly touching the tube. So it keeps the really critical areas extremely clean. So this was engineered by um, by our really amazing engineers early on so that we make sure we meet the planetary protection needs. That's so cool. And I love that you yeah. brought a prop. It's always great to have props with this because um, it <laughs> yeah. also demonstrates really, it, it's not a theory, it's, it's in practicality. And if we go to our next image, we can see you taking yeah. a look at those from underneath. Exactly. Uh, number five. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really, I mean, it, we all had to pinch ourselves seeing it in real life. Um, it's not just a CAD drawing anymore. It's not in piece parts uh, being assembled. That, that was the final deal. And that sample was taken uh, just moments before the belly pan was put on the bottom of the rover. 
So that's, yeah, and that sample really illustrates how we need help from all kinds of people to, you know, to, to make this happen. That's very cool. Um, yeah. I, it's just, it's, I love your joy and your excitement that you're, you're just talking about. It's um, as the spacecraft. And once again, folks, uh, Mars 2020 is heading to Mars, scheduled to land on February 18th. We'll keep saying that, but the mission that, that, Mu is working on, um, but this can't be done in a vacuum, right? Planetary protection has to be, you're not just looking over somebody's shoulder like, hey, don't do that, are you? Yeah, no. In fact, what you see in this picture here, it took the agreement of a lot of people. I mean, first of all, we have to make sure NASA headquarters is on board because they have to make sure that the planetary protection policies and procedures are equally applied across the board. So we have headquarters that we're always constantly communicating with. Um, there's also uh, processes that we have where, for example, independent reviewers come in and they see exactly what we're doing and they make sure that all of our processes are sound. So I know there's even a couple of independent reviewers uh, listening to this Von Karman lecture today. <laughs> um, but yeah, we need just a group of people to include also our own team members. That swab, if I swab the wrong place, that's bad for the contamination control engineers. So we have to make sure we're all in agreement and all on the same page about where I sample and when in the process, myself and my team members sample. So yeah, it's not done in a vacuum at all. Well, let's talk about um, specifically, like Mars is one thing, right? You're going to Mars, there's a very specific idea of what we have there. Um, let's say you're going someplace a little further out. Let's say yeah. you're going to someplace like Europa. Um, how do you leverage these models? How do you kind of assess what is okay and what isn't? Yeah, the, so there are a lot of tried and true policies and procedures that we use to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that the spacecraft is clean. But we also bridge and infuse a lot of new and cutting edge technologies. For example, we're looking at metagenomics, so looking at the genetic material of everything that might be present on that spacecraft and understanding specifically what's there and what could possibly uh, survive or thrive in that kind of high radiation environment on Europa. So we can really have an even more tailored and targeted approach to get rid of, for example, microbes that have a higher resistant to radiation like Deinococcus radiodurans. That's one of the most radiation resistant microbes that we can find on Earth. So we, we use a lot of new techniques and try to infuse that as we continue to build upon the, the strong foundation of planetary protection. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. To something we were talking about before, we're talking, uh, there are different levels for each mission. Um, and earlier, you didn't take the bait when I said, you're not just pointing, looking at people over their shoulders and pointing yeah. out things that are going wrong. Um, if we go to image six, I mean, you have to be a part of this team, right? Yeah. I love this picture of uh, when it comes to talking about teamwork. So we're not, you know, over someone's shoulder saying, you know, this is wrong. You should do that in a cleaner way. You know, we're all a team. So we're shoulder to shoulder pointing out that there's something wrong and you need to improve it. <laughs> no, we're together. <laughs> we're as one. Um, and there are times we call each other out because we're all trying to make sure we do the right thing. Uh, and, and yeah, and this is one great example. So this is a picture of us unboxing the descent stage at, at the Cape, at Kennedy Space Center. And in order to unbox it in a clean way and lift it, we had to make sure that it had a layer of covering, that Amherstat layer there that you see, um, in order to, because we found out that the crane that they're using doesn't have an umbrella. So we had to make sure that as the crane operated, it didn't drop any new particulates and microbes on that descent stage that we knew was already clean before it left JPL. So we, we came together and they said, all right, we can lift it and we can cut the, the covering so that it still covers the top of the descent stage. So we're able to get the cleanliness uh, requirements achieved and move the spacecraft because we need a spacecraft too. Yeah. So yeah, teamwork yeah. makes the dream work. And teamwork makes the dream work. Um, how much uh, evolution is there in techniques? Um, I mean, is what you're doing on this mission different than what has done been done on earlier missions? 
Yeah, uh, there are some things that stay the same. Uh, and a lot of the swabbing that we're doing, I mean, microbiology is a, a very old and, uh, and also very much evolving uh, discipline. But a lot of what used to was invented, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago is still pretty reliable. Uh, so we still take swabs of the spacecraft or wipes, depending on the surface area that we're taking samples from. Uh, and we grow them up and we look for bacterial endospores. And these are seed -like, microbes that can make these seed-like structures that could possibly survive that harsh environment of space. So we use old tech, but then there's still, like we were talking about earlier, a lot of new tech that we're, that we're using. So we're trying to bridge the gap. <laughs> Br bridging the gap is great. Let's go to actually uh, image seven. Um, and there's some good... Oh. Yeah. Yes, I, your eyes lit up. You nerded out when you saw it. Um, talk to me a little <laughs> bit about this. I love numbers. This. Yeah, so this really illustrates uh, the, the hard work of every single person on the planetary protection team. This is not a one person effort. There were 11 to, depending on the time of, you know, when you pick the time point, 11 to 15 people you know, physically working on this mission. And over the course of the entire seven years, we've been collecting samples. We've taken 13,042 swabs, 3,521 wipes, 318 air samples. And the reason why we take air samples is you can imagine when you're assembling in a clean environment, you have to make sure that the air around you is still clean. It is a clean room. It's usually clean. <laughs> and then also we took uh, 1,122 genetic samples. You remember I was telling you about looking at the genetic material and kind of getting an understanding of what's there independent of what can be cultured in the laboratory. So we took a lot of samples all across the board, not only the spacecraft, but the tables that are by the spacecraft, the tools that you use to hold particular components, because you want to make sure that even the tools that touch the spacecraft are extremely clean. So we took we took a lot of samples. <laughs> we have to make sure we do it right because we're bringing these samples back one day and we have to ensure that it is clean enough. So if our spacecraft is on Mars and it sends back and it turns out it was you, we found samples of Moo <laughs> on Mars, you would have the sample of that to, to match that with. Yeah, well, we really focus on the microbial uh, DNA. Okay. The, the human side, we, we dump that data. <laughs> <laughs> no okay, human DNA. Cool. <laughs> no human DNA. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about these. You mentioned it a little earlier, but um, owing to the changing PP context, I mean, these part of your requirements. Um, we, uh, if we bring up the image of Europa, I think it's number nine. Um, sending something there, and you talked about develop. Everything kind of evolves in, in these different ways. Um, yeah. How do you reassess these guidelines? Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a, a lot of communication and a lot of uh, meetings, right, with, by people far, far above my head, right? <laughs> but it takes uh, the, the minds of many, many bright scientists to come together and make sure that the needs of you know, going to Europa are not, not only satisfied, but really well understood. And one of the ways, for example, that we're trying to implement that on the Europa lander mission is making a probability model to understand the probability of contamination. There are so many factors that you need to understand. Uh, number one, are there these special microbes on there that can resist um, a, a radi high radiation environment? You know, like how, how lethal is that environment? And how much can we rely on that to really kill off the microbes as we make our way to, to Europa? So there's a lot of new things that we're trying to to incorporate to really understand this picture better. Well, I think that's something that's neglected or not thought of is all the things that you don't know yet. Um, yeah. How do you predict to how do you protect what you can't predict? Yeah, that's a really great question. And a lot of times when we have uh, these peer reviews, remember I was mentioning one of the ways that we make sure we're doing the right thing is if you're in a group all alone, if you're in a room with just a team of people you usually work with, you're gonna have a lot of innovative ideas, but there might be something that could have fallen through the cracks. So you wanna make sure that you invite all of the right people, the right stakeholders to make sure that things weren't missed and they usually bring something new to the table. 
so that we can get a comprehensive picture of what we have to do. Cool. Um, yeah. I want to go back to the polo that you're wearing right now. You've got your <laughs> Atlo Mars 2020 um, from the launch. Uh, a story that you you told me was about, um, and I, this kind of leads into uh, communicating with headquarters, but when's the last time that you see the spacecraft? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I love this question because there are, there are pictures that we're not allowed to share, right? <laughs> While we're on the launch pad, but we sample all the way till the very, very end. Um, myself and one of my colleagues, Guyana Kazarians, we were uh, in the vertical integration facility before they put the aeroshell door on, we had to sample the aeroshell door they placed that on a few days later, uh, we were ready to close up the, the entire vehicle. So right before the fairing door and the fairing is that part that you see during the launch that launches into, into space. Well, actually it doesn't go all the way to space, but it launches and then it separates. We took the last sample before that fairing door went on. So just days before launch, we were up there um, taking samples. It, it, it was pretty, we had to pinch ourselves. <laughs> Um, so we, you mentioned this earlier and this is kind of the last question before I, I want to talk about one final, so two final things, um, you talk about communicating with headquarters. How big of a deal is that with each individual mission? Yeah, it, it's a huge deal. Headquarters, uh, headquarters is the group that signs off. So for example, the planetary protection officer at NASA headquarters, she signs off, uh, Lisa Pratt signs off to make sure that yes, I indeed agree with everything that was done, everything that was presented. Um, by that time where she's supposed to sign off, she was led through the entire journey, right? She doesn't get the information at the end, um, but it's up to her to really certify that this mission is good to go from a planetary protection perspective. Um, and it's not only her, but also everyone else at headquarters. I mean, there are a lot of stakeholders, uh, people who are interested in, in the science, uh, the science overlaps of what we do for planetary protection and how it enables us to do better science. Uh, so there's a lot of stakeholders and they all have to agree <laughs> that we've done a great job. And they all have to agree that you've done a great job. Um, yeah. And then I love your excitement. I, I've said it before, I'm gonna keep saying it because it makes me excited about <laughs> planetary protection. Um, <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about because I know this is not the only talk you're you're doing, right? Like I know you go out all the time and, and reach out to people and kind of a bookend from where we started. Um, talk to me about spreading the message. Yeah, I mean, it, we were talking a, a little offline, right, uh, earlier about how just every time I walk on campus at JPL, I pinch myself and my my inner middle schooler is just super excited that the, that little kid that got the light bulb moment and that's why I feel so passionate about science uh, outreach, STEAM outreach, because we need the artists too to make these beautiful graphics that you see today. I mean, you should have seen what I gave them and what they did with these graphics. <laughs> so education and outreach are, is extremely important to me and I feel a duty to pay it forward and turn on a few more light bulbs for others. So yeah, the, the only contagion that I agree with is spreading the love for science and engineering. Very cool. Now, I know there have yeah. been some questions already in the chat. There were questions before we even started talking tonight. People are very <laughs> interested in this. So what's going on with our chat, Nikki? Well, I have to tell you, people are incredibly, as Brian said, excited about having you with <laughs> us tonight. Um, I want to start with a question from Daniel on Twitter, who asks us, why are we so worried about sp spreading microbes? Maybe that's how life got started here. We've got plenty to share. So why not spread the love? <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're so giving with your microbes. Um, yeah, I mean, in a certain context, right, you can spread spread the love, uh, it, maybe it, on, in the Earth environment. But when it comes to interplanetary and exploration and looking at other moons, the goal is to not spread our own contaminants in, inadvertently, right? You don't want it, you want to make sure that we are doing good science and it's just the right thing to do. And yes, that may have been the original mechanism for seeding planets. You know, panspermia is a, a, a prevalent astrobiological theory. 
Uh, but when we send spacecraft out, we just want to make sure it's not because of us. Right? It can happen naturally. It can happen by any other means. But we just don't want to be the, the one spreading based on spacecraft, uh, spacecraft transfer. Well, thanks for uh, clearing that up. So now that we know for sure, we want to watch out for that. Uh, Johnny asks on Facebook, how do we detect contaminants that we've never seen before that maybe don't look like what we know on Earth or maybe are from Earth that we don't recognize? That's, yeah, that's a really cool question. And so far, the model that we have in our brains and that we work to is life as we know it. And there are a lot of really brilliant people who discover things accidentally. Uh, and there are people working on theoretical forms of life that may have ways that we can enhance our detection capabilities so that we can see those kind of things. Uh, but for now, that's why we're trying to improve not only growing things in the lab, but also looking at the DNA, just in case there's some something that we're doing that we're there's some way that we're culturing this in the lab where we can't see everything on the DNA level that really helps us to see much more. And if you can find, invent a new way to find a new form of life, we would love to hear that. <laughs> but we're always, always evolving. So yeah, that's a great question. So I've got another one here, similar topic from Kristen on Facebook, who's asking, what are some of the strangest particles you've ever had to clean off of a spacecraft and found from objects going to space or coming from space? Ooh, the strangest particles that I would have to clean off of spacecraft. Um, none of them have been too strange. <laughs> uh, the, usually the particulates that we find are common in the clean room environment. And just to double check, we have these instruments where we can look at it uh, in an SEM, a scanning electron microscope. And then we also use uh, what we call X-ray diffraction. So it, it hits it with x-rays and based on what comes out of it the signature that comes out of it we can identify what it is so a lot of it is just things that you would find typically um the the mop like fibers of maybe the mop that is used to clean the clean room environment um and just like normal particulates so we've gotten a chance to talk a little bit about you know different things you might find but uh, Timothy has a different question for us from LinkedIn. Do you believe that earlier Mars missions may have contaminated their landing site? And I think you've got a little uh, video for us as well. Oh, I do, yeah. <laughs> I get this question here and there, so that's why we put a backup video in here, just in case we get this question. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that my opinion is that likely we did not contaminate it. I mean, Ur Ur Mars is such a heavily bombarded UV environment. Uh, and if you look at this really beautiful animation here, um, you can see all of the landing sites on the surface of Mars, uh, including where Perseverance is gonna land. And it's extremely far away from all of the other landing sites. So likely with the landing of all the prior missions, right? Likely it is not, did not contaminate the surface of Mars, but if big if it did it's it's pretty pretty far away so the likelihood that anything that came from another spacecraft would get into our sample um, is very not very likely at all it's great to hear that <laughs> for all of us that are looking forward to this wonderful landing coming up uh, of the mars 2020 rover uh, Aaron has a little bit of a different question for you. So obviously you're working in the realm of working with NASA headquarters and here at JPL and some of our missions, but Aaron on LinkedIn wants to know, what is the science community doing to ensure that space industries are also following protocols to protect the solar system from Earth and the Earth from the solar system? Yeah, that, that's a really, really great question, especially in light of uh, all of the work that's happening, you know, with all of our, our brother and sister institutions. Um, and at least one thing that I can speak to is one of the things that we're trying to do within planetary protection is make the policies and the rules more accessible, at least implementing it. Um, we were talking about doing metagenomics and taking samples and really looking at the DNA and just doing things and evolving it so that it's not extremely expensive uh, to implement planetary protection. So it's more, it gives uh, other companies more of an advantage to like, hey, we can do this, it's, it's achievable, um, and it makes it more accessible to others. 
Well, we like accessibility. Um, glad to hear that uh, things are being taken seriously by the community. Uh, we've got a question here a little bit about that teamwork you were talking about earlier and how important it is that everyone works together. Uh, Tom on LinkedIn wants to know, have any designs sort of been changed or had to be thrown away due to violating contamination constraints? Oh, to violate, uh, well, it's interesting that you say that. Let me, let me t answer a slightly different <laughs> rendition of your question as far as designs being thrown away. Early on, I remember uh, when the first design of the drill bit, there used to be and what we called OBOC, one bit, one core. And we were just so concerned about planetary protection and sample integrity, biological sample integrity, that we thought, you know, we have to clean everything to the degree that we have cleaned our current um, sample tubes and drills. But for each core, there has to be one sample that we acquire, and then it's automatically too dirty. And that design had to be thrown away because now you're imagining we have to send 40 drill bits and, and 40 tubes, you know, 43 tubes, 43 drill bits. That is just way too many. It's just too, way too heavy. Um, so that design had to be thrown away and it was updated to the design that we have today. Uh, so yeah, there there has definitely been a lot of evolution of, of designs early on so that we can meet the planetary protection and science needs and make sure it's not too heavy. Well, that's important too. Um, we've got a question a little different about what's kind of going on in our world today from Joshua. Uh, Joshua asks us, how has COVID-19 affected your work with regard to cleaning and microbes in the clean room? Yeah, so I, I get this question often. I love answering this question because when I see what everyone is doing just out when I go outside, I think, well, everybody is now their own version of a planetary protection engineer. I mean, what you're doing when you wear a mask is you're protecting other people from your biosphere and vice versa. So I'm actually quite proud of, of the world <laughs> for being their own uh, mini version of, of planetary protection engineers. Uh, but as far as our processes uh, that we've done at JPL and that we carried on to KSC to get us to the launch pad, uh, fortunately, a lot of what we decided to do is completely robust against COVID-19 and, and all of the, the changes that had to happen you know, due to this pandemic. For example, when we were assembling the, you know, sampling the tubes, the critical tubes and seals and uh, all the hardware that's gonna touch the surface of Mars, we had to not only wear full bunny suits that you see in the clean room, but we also had to wear sterile goggles, a sterile smock and sterile gloves. And that just kept everybody protected the entire time from, from, from transferring contaminants from the environment to the critical samples. So whether or not COVID-19 was a thing, we still had the best policies and procedures in place. So that, that didn't change a thing. Well, it's good to hear that uh, you've been able to keep moving forward despite what's going on and truly persevere with the <laughs> Mars 2020 rover and our other missions at JPL. Um, Tim has an additional question for us from Facebook, and he wants to know, isn't planetary protection sort of incompatible with human exploration in general? Oh, this question is very deep. <laughs> um, so it's not that it's incompatible, but you're right that the whole landscape would change. For example, if we focus on Mars, right, and we are really doing our best to make sure that any Earth microbes don't get onto Mars. And humans, we know humans are a cesspool of microorganisms. And that's, that's a good thing. We need all of these microbes in and on our body to regulate our, our functions. Uh, in fact, if you count the amount of uh, bacteria and, and microorganisms on and in our body, we're actually more microbe than we are human. <laughs> so once you send this bag of, uh, bag of bacteria to a place like Mars, it's really difficult. I mean, you'd have to think of uh, natural preserves, for example, where humans don't go and maybe keep an area pristine on Mars. So there, there's definitely an evolution that needs to occur as we send humans to other places in our solar system. So totally right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the work you do has evolved over time and it, and it really is incredible. Um, you've been inspiring a lot of students or aspiring students in our chat. And we've got a lot of questions from them. They want advice. They want to know how to network. 
Uh, but we've also got a question in here uh, from Jordan on LinkedIn, who wants to go back to university as a 35 year old for computer engineering. They all want some advice. They wanna know how to get where you are today. Yeah, one of the biggest answers, uh, the most common answers that I give when I talk to um, college students, uh, especially college students who are just starting off fresh is make sure you use your summers. Every time, uh, for example, every time I had a summer you know, vacation, I would spend that time in the lab, do an internship, apply. Uh, and what really helped me is it, it allowed me to get more exposure and network. My first internship at Langley, so I started off with computer programming in atmospheric sciences, but when I was at NASA Langley, I worked in the technical library because by then I was 17. So I shouldn't, I wasn't allowed near really important things, <laughs> but I was able to look up uh, scientific publications, talk to other scientists that came through the technical library because they were looking for, for publications to support their work. And that allowed me to align my next rotation in uh, plasma physics. And it was only because of that, that I turned on to plasma sciences, plasma engineering and, and worked my way into my PhD. So put yourself in these situations, get those internships, use it as leverage to talk to, to new people and, and line your next opportunity up. Because, and, and keep in mind too, when we're talking about success and failures, even if you don't like what you're doing at your internship, you're that much closer to doing what you love because you figured out what you don't want to do. <laughs> so do it, internships. Well, I'm glad to hear that that has been your path forward. Thank you for inspiring so many students and aspiring students tonight. We've got time for one more question. Uh, Ray Leon on LinkedIn wants to know, would you ever want to take the trip to Mars yourself? <laughs> That's a great question. I think one day uh, I would love to take that trip, although it's quite a long journey. Um, I, I really I really like it here on Earth and I admire everyone who <laughs> wants to go to Mars and I will do my best to support you and cheer you on <laughs> from afar. Maybe I'll go to the International Space Station one day, but uh, I'll support the next generation. I like Thank that you very much. <laughs> Yeah, for supporting the next generation. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions tonight. Thank you, Nikki, for helping us out with that. Um, before I thank everyone, I would like to remind you, and they're going to they're gonna bring up the website on the screen here in a second, as we discussed that Mars 2020 is on its way to the Martian surface and is scheduled to arrive in two weeks from today on Thursday, February 18th. So if you go to go.nasa.gov, slash Mars 2020 toolkit, and you also see it in the chat below, uh, you will find all sorts of goodies, landing resources, how to participate, how to watch online, and so, so much more. We say it often on these talks, this is your space program. We want you to be involved. We want you to share in these moments. We want you to share them with us because they belong to all of us. So please follow along with the aptly named Perseverance on February 18th, once again, at go.nasa.gov slash Mars 2020 cool toolkit. It is a cool kit, but it's the toolkit. Our next talk on March 11th will be helicopters in space about the Mars helicopter ingenuity. A lot of cool things coming our way. I would like to thank Dr. Mujige Cooper for joining us this evening for her intelligence, her passion, her joy. Thank you, Nikki, and everyone behind the scenes, the social media team, TV ops, everyone who makes this possible. And finally, a big thank you to all of you who join us each and every single month. Stay safe, stay kind, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>